they're real barriers for people being kind to themselves. And it's funny, it doesn't come up with others. We don't really think that the best way to motivate your friend is to call them like a lazy slob who's worthless. <laughs> and yet somehow we think the best way to motivate ourselves mm -hmm. is to say, oh, I'm a lazy right. slob who's worthless. Like, really? Welcome to Sleeping Around, where we offer a peek behind the curtain of modern sex and relationship therapy and research, bringing you insights and conversations otherwise reserved for the therapy room. I'm your host, Elena Joy, a master's of counseling psychology student, content creator, and lifelong sex and relationship nerd. Enjoy the episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Sleeping Around. Today's episode is with a personal hero of mine, Dr. Kristen Neff. As you may or may not know, the Mindful Self-Compassion, the MSC program, changed my life back in 2015. And I was trained as a teacher in 2016. I then taught the program myself for a few years. Dr. Kristen Neff is an associate professor of educational psychology at the University of Texas at Austin. She is a pioneer in the field of self-compassion research, conducting the first empirical studies on self-compassion more than 20 years ago. She's been recognized as one of the most influential researchers in psychology worldwide. She runs the Self-Compassion Community, an online learning platform where people can learn the skill of self-compassion with the help of others. This is linked in the description and in the show notes. She's also the author of the best-selling books, Self-Compassion and Fierce Self-Compassion, along with her colleague, Chris Germer, another personal hero. She developed the empirically supported Mindful Self-Compassion program and co-founded the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion. They co-wrote the best-selling Mindful Self-Compassion workbook and have a new book called Mindful Self-Compassion for Burnout that has just been released. For more information, you can go to selfcompassion.org. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. I am thrilled that uh, we get to have this conversation and that I get to share some of your work with my listeners because your book, um, the program, the Mindful Self-Compassion program, it absolutely changed my life back in 2015, 2016, like over a decade ago. And yeah, I, I can't thank you enough for, for the impact that your work has had on my life. So to be able to sit here and speak with you is like truly a dream come true. Well, thank you so much. And I guess you're an early adopter, huh? Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's I cool. think I, I, I got in early. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. After reading the book, I was like, I need to know absolutely everything about this that I can. Wonderful. How, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into this work? I'm actually trained as a developmental psychologist, and it was my last year of graduate school. For purely personal reasons, um, I was under a lot of stress. I'd actually just gotten a divorce. It was a messy divorce, and I was under a lot of stress about, you know, would I get a job after getting my PhD? Um, and so I decided to learn mindfulness meditation because I'd heard that mindfulness was good for stress. And really just by luck of the draw, I happened, my first class happened to be in the tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh, who was a Zen teacher, who's one of the people who talked most explicitly about self-compassion, about how we needed to aim the lens of warmth and support and kindness inward as well as outward. And so in my personal life, I just saw immediately the difference it made my, in my ability to cope with everything I was going through, with my negative thoughts, my feelings. I would just actually say, Kristen, this is hard for you. You know, I'm here for you, just like I might say to a friend. And I saw firsthand the big difference it made in my ability to cope. And then um, I did get a job at the University of Texas at Austin, and I decided to do research on it. So that was over 20 years ago. I created a scale to measure it, and then I started doing research. And then I met a colleague named Chris Germer who said, Kristen, it's not enough just to do research on this. You need to teach people how to be more self-compassionate because <laughs> it doesn't mm -hmm. come naturally for a lot of reasons we can talk about. And so we created the Mindful Self-Compassion Program and then written lots of books. And actually our fifth book is coming out, as it's uh, or my fifth book this uh, fall called Mindful Self-Compassion for Burnout. Mm. So, you know, the, the amazing thing about self-compassion, which is really how we deal with the tough stuff, our feelings of distress or stress or, you know, feelings of inadequacy, um, it can be applied 
basically toward any difficult experience in life. <laughs> and so burnout's one that I also experienced personally through the COVID pandemic, and I'm just being overworked like many of us are, and realizing again how useful self-compassion is for burnout. So in other words, it's a long way of saying for me, it always starts with my personal practice, and then I research and I teach what I've learned in my real life. <laughs> Right. So it's it's a personal impact. And then it's going, wait, let's find some empirical support for this. Let's figure out what's going on. And then yes. when you see the, the power and the impact that these practices have, the empirical support that they have, then it's how can we teach this? How can we spread this around? Exactly. And that's really, I think, what excites me the most is how to help other people um, learn skills of self-compassion because it, really, it truly is life-changing. That's not a hyperbole. It, it really does change everything when you when you learn how to be warm and caring and supportive toward mm -hmm. yourself. Uh, you mentioned saying, oh, Kristen, this is hard, like you would to a friend. Can you tell yeah. us a bit more about, from the ground up, what is self-compassion? Yeah, well, so if you want to look at the Latin roots of the word compassion, passion means to suffer, calm is with. So it really is literally, how are we with suffering? And normally we think of how are we compassionate toward others? Are we with others in a warm, supportive, caring, understanding way, as opposed to being like cold and judgmental? And then so self-compassion very simply is how do we show up for our own suffering? Are we with ourselves in a warm, supportive, caring way, as opposed to being harsh and judgmental? So that's the very easy way to think about it. And then in a more detailed way, so when I decided I wanted to measure it, I realized I needed more of an operational definition with you know more clear parameters so I could measure it. And by the way, people have different models of self-compassion, but in my model, I um, argue that it has three main components. So not only the kindness, but also mindfulness. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. not, a, it's not a mistake that I learned about self-compassion while learning mindfulness. So mindfulness actually is what allows us the presence of mind to be with our suffering. Normally when, when things are difficult, we want to fight it or resist it or run away or pretend it's not there. And so we need mindfulness just to be able to say, oh, okay, this is what's happening. This hurts. Right? So that's actually the first step. And then also really important what makes uh, compassion different from them, pity is a sense of connectedness to others. So if I were to pity you, for instance, you probably wouldn't like it because I'd be like looking down on you. I'd, feel, I'd be separate from you. Whereas if I showed you compassion, I'd say something like, oh yeah, hey, I've been there. It happens to all of us. And it's the exact same thing with self-compassion. Instead of being self-pity, poor me, woe is me, you know, I, I, everyone else is living a perfect normal life and it's just me who's suffering. <laughs> mm -hmm. We remember, hey, this is the human condition. This is the plan we signed up for as human beings. We make mistakes. We're imperfect. We struggle. We, we have strengths and we also have weaknesses um, and we have challenges and that's just how we learn and how we grow. And this is actually what connects us to others, not what separates us from others. And so when you have those three elements together, then you have this really healthy, stable mindset that the research shows is so good for a mental and, and actually physical well-being as well. But before we get to the rest of the episode, I want to take a second to thank Nancy for partnering with Sleeping Around. Nancy is in the business of pleasure products, for any of you who are not familiar. They are all too familiar with the limitations and stereotypes around adult toys and pleasure, that these toys can sometimes be intimidating or complicated or ugly. <laughs> they are redefining the game and challenging the status quo. Meet the Lem. This is just one of the toys that Nancy offers, but I wanted to show it to you in this beautiful box because, oh my God, the packaging. But what I really wanna talk about is their Beginner Bliss Bundle, which includes the Lem, but it also includes the Uno. These are toys that are designed to not only be cute, but they're beginner friendly. For example, the Uno is a personal massage wand, but it's designed for beginners. The vibration settings start low and slow. A lot of vibrators can be really intense, not the Uno. 
And the Lem, not only is it cute, but it's designed for people who are curious about these suction type toys. And in the Beginner Bliss bundle, you get both. Plus, you know I have a discount for you all. If you use the code Elena J at checkout, you can get 25% off your order. The toys are made of premium, waterproof, body safe silicone. They're so smooth to the touch and they're cute. This will all be linked in the description. I recommend you go check it out. Thank you, thank you, thank you to Nancy for partnering with us here on Sleeping Around. So you need the mindfulness piece to notice that you're suffering yes. in the first place. And to be with, and not without with. running for the hills. Right, but, right. Okay, like kind of that strength and courage. <laughs> okay, I can be with this. Hurts, mm -hmm. but it's happening. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the being with is the self-kindness piece. This is the offering care. So the being with is the mindfulness piece. The offering care. So you might be mindful and just, okay, I notice that I'm suffering. What does that feel like in my body? Okay, it's here. But you aren't really extending yourself warmth. You aren't allowing your heart to be moved by the fact that you're having difficulty. Mm. It'd be like with a friend. Yeah, so your friend calls you up. Instead of ignoring them, you pick up the phone and you listen to them. And so that's step one. That's mindfulness. But also really important is you say to your friend things like, oh, I'm so sorry. How can I help? Or I understand that must be so hard. You can actually give kindness, mm. warmth, care, understanding to your friend who's hurting. And then the third piece is common humanity, saying something like, hey, I've been there. Or it's, of course you feel that way. Anyone would feel that way in your situation. You kind of normalize it, humanize and what your friend is going through. And so we do the same thing with ourselves. We humanize what we're going through. Wow. I feel like a lot of what you've just explained kind of pushes back against some common misconceptions about yes. self-compassion. Like you mentioned pity. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about what the common pushbacks might be? Yeah, oh, there's so many pushbacks. It's sad, actually, because it, <laughs> right. it, it, they're real barriers for people being kind to themselves. And it's funny, it doesn't come up with others. We don't really think that the best way to motivate your friend is to call them like a lazy slob who's worthless. <laughs> and yet somehow we think the best way to motivate ourselves mm -hmm. is to say, oh, I'm a lazy right. slob who's worthless. Like, really? Mm -hmm. So um, some of the misconceptions are, well, like you say, it's self-pity. It's actually less self-focused than self-criticism. Self-criticism, you know, shaming oh. ourselves, we're very self-focused. Whereas if we say, hey, you know, it's part of the learning experience, it's what humans do, then we're actually less self-focused. We're less focused on what's wrong with us and more focused on like how we're relating to what's happening. And so that when we're in that position of compassion, then we, f we naturally feel more connected to the larger whole. Um, another one is that it's weak. They think that, you know, being hard and tough and like beating ourselves up means we're, <laughs> mm -hmm. means we're strong. When actually that's totally the opposite of what the research shows. Because if you, if you want to get through a difficult situation, you have to be an ally to yourself. You know, whether you're in combat, and there's lots of research with veterans showing veterans who are more self-compassionate, they're less likely to develop PTSD, for instance, or whether it's getting through hurricanes or divorce. In other words, if you show up for yourself and you say things like, I have your back, what do you need? How can I help? That's going to make you stronger, not weaker. Um, but probably the biggest one is this idea that it's going to undermine our motivation, that we'll be either be irresponsible, that we'll just let ourselves off the hook, or we won't try very hard, we won't reach our goals. Again, the research shows the exact opposite. If we're there for ourselves, if we ask ourselves, what do I need? And maybe that question is, what do I need to perform at my best? Or what do I need to change an unhealthy habit? Or a situation that's not healthy for me? Or a relationship that's not healthy for me? And so self-compassion is about making those changes, not because you have to, to be adequate, but simply because you want to, because you care. So uh, again, re you know, research dispels all these myths, but people still don't believe it. You got You really have to try it out and test it for yourself. That's the only thing that's really going <laughs> to convince you. Way. See what happens. You know. So uh, on this show, we talk a lot about dating, sex, relationships, um, and sharing kind of applicable, practical things that we can uh, we can do in that in that arena in our lives. And I'm. I'm hearing you talk about self-compassion. I, you know, I have my own self-compassion practice and I'm wondering how do you apply those tenets within relationship? Yeah, so, um, and by the way, I just have to give a little shout out for a colleague, Michelle Becker. She's developed a program called Compassion for Couples, 
which is about compassion for your partner and also self-compassion. So, um, you know, people have thought a lot about it. And I've actually done some research with couples um, and also all sorts of relationships, friendships, family relationships. But I, I did one study where we recruited um, 100 heterosexual couples and we measured each partner's self-compassion level. And we had each partner say, okay, tell us about your partner and how the relationship's going. And what we found is that people who are more self-compassionate are described by their partner as being, you know, a better relationship partners, more intimate, more giving, less controlling. Mm. They were happier, more satisfied mm -hmm. with self-compassionate partners. And a lot of that is it really the, the dynamics of um, meeting needs. So we all have needs. We need we have needs for comfort. We have needs for care. We have needs for rest. We have needs for sex. We have all sorts of needs. And if we put all our eggs in the basket of another person. In other words, like if I'm feeling upset, I need you to comfort me. I need you to make me happy. I need you to make me feel better. Then what happens if you're, maybe you're having an off day, you're stressed after work and you can't meet my needs, then I'm gonna be frustrated, I'm gonna be unhappy, maybe I'm gonna complain about it, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if we can meet our own needs, we not, not solely, obviously we also need other people, but if like our primary caretaker is ourself, Okay, what do I need to be well right now? Um, can I, can I, if I'm upset, can I be there for myself? Can I soothe myself? Can I comfort myself? Can I motivate myself? Can I support myself? And when we do that, that means that we actually have more resources to give to others. We aren't so dependent. Our happiness isn't so contingent on the other person. So that's one of the ways it helps is because we're able to meet some of our own needs. Mm -hmm. The other real reason it helps in relationships is it allows us to be authentic. So one thing about self-compassion is um, it's a form of self-worth that comes simply from being human. Now, unlike self-esteem, which is a t type of self-worth that comes from judgment, you know, an estimation of our value. I'm good, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm likable, whatever it is, I'm, I'm successful. And so self-esteem tends to be contingent. Like, I like myself when you like me, or I like myself when I look in the mirror and see what I see what I see, or when I make my work work goals. Mm -hmm. But it you know it kind of deserts us when we need it most. And where self compassion is it's unconditional, right? When I'm up and I'm down, it's like a fair, it's like a stable friend. Even if I fail, I'm still going to be a friend to myself. And so what happens often is in relationships when we put again all the eggs in the our basket mm -hmm. of our partner. Like I'm going to like myself as long as my partner approves of me or as long as my partner likes me, or as long, long as my partner thinks what I'm doing is good, we suddenly <laughs> start losing ourselves. Yeah. You know, we become inauthentic. And then when we do that, when, we're, when we aren't our true self, when we're, when we're acting the way that we think our partner wants us to be, we can't really be intimate because intimacy comes from two authentic souls coming together, you know, in a mutual reciprocal way. And so when we, when, when our worth is unconditional, when we know, you know, yeah, of course I want my partner to like me, but I'm going to be myself. That's even, even more important is that I like myself. Then that leads to more authenticity, which leads to more, um, but more intimacy. It also leads to more uh, compromise solutions in, in conflict. So instead of just saying, okay, I'll do what you want to avoid conflict, or instead of saying, my way or the highway, your needs don't matter, it's like, okay, we actually did research on this, how, how self-compassionate couples negotiate conflict. And they're much more likely to say, okay, your needs are important, but my needs are important too. How do we come up with a solution that you know makes compromise, or that's win-win, or somehow helps us both? And so when you subordinate yourself to a partner, then that's gonna cause problems in power dynamics. And if you ignore your partner, that's gonna cause a problem. But if you really want an equal, truly reciprocal relationship, then you care for yourself at the same time that you care for your partner. Okay, so if the two kind of pieces in relationship are being your own primary caregiver, meeting your own needs, you know, being there for yourself, and then also um, allowing for authenticity. Going back to the first piece, Let's say you, you're in conflict with your partner or you're, something is happening in your day where you want to meet your own need. You've recognized, okay, I'm, I'm having a hard time. I'm in a moment of suffering. I want to offer myself kindness. Okay, what do I need? And the, the need that arises is I need them. You, you said it. I need them to comfort me. 
I need yeah. them to tell me they love me. I need them to do X, Y, Z, and that's what I need. Yeah, and, and that's it's very common because we've been told that that's what romantic partners are for. They meet mm-hmm. all your emotional needs. And sure, it's lovely when that happens, and it's nice to have that person. And, you know, it's not downplaying the importance of love, but if you're looking for love in your partner, you're looking for love in the wrong place. Because even even sometimes when your partner loves you, you know, if you don't love yourself, it just like it, you know, just goes straight over your head. So the love huh. needs to start at home. We, we really need to, you know, love all those parts of ourselves that maybe we judge or that we don't like or we think, you know, are are not the way we want them to be. Kind of our happiness and satisfaction primarily not only but primarily comes from how am i relating to myself in this moment Mm. right and also it it comes from the shift away from what's happening to how i'm relating to what's happening because if your Mm. happiness is contingent on circumstances which is either the circumstances of you know i'm succeeding or something or i look a certain way or I'm, i'm having these positive thoughts or if your happiness is contingent on your partner, your partner is there for you, they're you know, loving you, they're caring for you, then your happiness is unstable because we can't control conditions. Oh man, uh-huh. What we can do is start to focus on, you know, is our heart open? Am I present? Is my awareness full of love and warmth and feelings of connection? And you can even have that toward a thought like, you know, oh, I really wish I hadn't done that. And so it can be an uncomfortable thought. It could be a painful thought, but you aren't just the thought. Mm. It's almost like we move our identification to the circumstance from, you know, again, the source of our happiness from circumstances to what's our heart and mind doing in this moment. And that actually, we, we have a saying in the compassion world. We have a lot of sayings, but one of the sayings is the goal of practice is simply to be a compassionate mess. Mm. which doesn't mean our goal is to be a mess. Of course it's not. Of course we want to get our stuff together. Of course, you know, we want to do the best we can. But our goal really starts moving toward, can I bring compassion? Can my heart be open? Can I be present? Can I have like this loving, awake awareness in my sense of who I am, even when things are difficult? And if that's your goal, then you can actually always succeed. It's something that's actually achievable. Whereas if if your goal is to control your partner or to control your own thoughts or to control your circumstances, good luck with that one. (laughs) You know, yeah, we all know how that one lands, don't Mm, we? Eventually, mm -hmm. because people are human, life life happens. Um, But our awareness and our warmth and our heart is always here with us. We just we forget about it. Here's the thing: we we become so entranced by the, the the allure of you know, what my partner's love or the circumstances be, being the way I want them to be, we forget that actually we have a whole ocean of love and compassion and connectedness and awareness and a presence right here. It's here right now. We just forget about it because we're so distracted in a way by that shiny object, which is, again, circumstances or, you know, we want our partner to be a certain way. And so, you know, you can see this goes beyond just partner relationships. It really applies to everything, you might say. It's, it's really, it's a, it's a radical mindset shift, focusing more on how we're relating to life as opposed to what life brings us in the moment. I have to say, one of the reasons why I, th- I think personally, this has been my experience, that romantic relationships are so amazing is because in, in those really intimate moments, like let's say you're lying in bed and you're just like, you're just there fully with your partner staring in their eyes. There's this sense of like merging, our sense of separate self dissolves. And we're kind mm. of in this field of loving awareness, right? We can, we can feel it. We're in the presence of loving. And this is the three components of compassion, which are mindfulness, common humanity, and kindness. Another way of talking about them is loving connected presence. That's what it feels oh, like. We're in a state mm-hmm. of loving, connected presence. And one of the reasons we, we, I think we like being with, in romantic relationships is when we have those moments, we actually become this field of loving, connected presence, and it's beautiful. And so we think that our partner is responsible for our ability to, re, to feel loving, connected presence. But that's actually an illusion. It can huh. help. It can be a doorway in. But loving, connected presence uh, lies in our own awareness, you know, so we have to really remember that. And we, we don't want to give all our power away or give all our happiness away to someone else. 
And then once you are in the ocean of loving connected presence, you just have so much more to give to others, whether it's your children or your partners or your friends or your work. And I say this as if I do this all the time. It's, it's, it's hard <laughs> to remember. Here's why. So don't beat yourself up if you aren't like, oh, I'm not in the loving, connected presence all the time. Mm -hmm. Because our brain actually didn't evolve to be this way. This is, we know this. Our brain evolved to create a sense of separate selves, to look, project that self in the past or the future and look for problems. So our brains evolve for survival, which is why we're always focused on the environment. Right. And so this is what it means to be a human being. Our brains operate one way, but we aren't, we aren't totally controlled by our brains in the sense that we have this loving awareness that can actually observe what the brain is doing and say, you know, thank you, brain, for trying to keep me safe. Actually, my son, I, I taught him this mantra, tricky brain, I know you're trying to keep me safe, but it's not helping right now. He's got, he has autism and OCD mm -hmm. and he's got some various things. And so, and we can all do that. Right. So brain is part of who we are, but we aren't, you know, we also have this awareness that can observe what the brain is doing. So the brain pushes us constantly toward negativity, toward threat. You know, is my, does my partner, do they look at me funny? Do what I say, is that going to offend them? You okay. know, constantly, then we could go down this negative loop. But we aren't just that. And that's what self-compassion reminds us of, is that we are also the loving, connected presence that's always here. Okay, we have this loving, connected presence. We have access to it. Our heart is, is always with us. The ability to kind of enter that compassionate state is, is always with us. How do we actually practice this skill that our brain has not evolved to naturally land on? Part of it is practice. We know that the brain is plastic, right? Practice makes, you know, what, what we, brain, neurons that fire together, wire together is the same. So the more we practice it, the more easily it comes to us, the more we remember, oh yeah, there's another way to deal with this. I can remember to kind of embody loving, connected presence. So that's one way through practice. Um, uh, it really helps to practice with others. For instance, this, my friend Michelle Becker, that her, her uh, program, Compassion for Couples, one of the reasons it's so great is if you can get your partner on board with this, and to remember that so, you, so other people can help you <laughs> remember <laughs> to be self-compassionate. That can be very, very good. Um, I've actually started something called the self-compassion community, which is like a membership community to get it. You know, it's, it's hard to do on your own. So it really helps to have other people who've got the same goal, reminding you to do it and how to do it. Um, there, there's lots of uh, exercises and meditations and little like short practices you can do to cultivate this mindset. There are books. I mean, really, the last ten years of my life has spent has been spent primarily on coming up with resources to help people be more self compassionate. So it's easy to do, but it's hard to remember. Right. <laughs> that's and the that's thing. where the practicing outside of a, a charged context exactly would probably be the best thing so w with the exercises and the practices if someone's going to go and and look up okay self-compassion practice uh let me get started what can they expect to find what does it look like yeah, well, so first of all, if you, if you do Google that, you'll find my website. So it's easy. It's a good place to start. And you can take my self-compassion scale and then you, know, you can do some practices. <laughs> mm -hmm. But really, so I mean, I think the three components are a really easy way to think about it. It's like, well, how do I bake a self-compassion cookie? I need one part mindfulness, one part common humanity, and one part kindness. Mm. So it could be as easy as, okay, I'm upset. I want to be self-compassionate. All right, so I need to bring in the mindfulness. So all mindfulness is the ability to kind of just, so instead of being lost in how upset you are. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say upset in, a, in the context of a conflict with a partner. Okay, so let's say you're in a conflict with your partner. So the first step is just to be aware, well, this really hurts. This is hard. Because normally what happens is all our awareness is, is like overwhelmed by the trying to win the argument or maybe mm. feel, feeling afraid of what might happen if, you know, if they leave us or all those other feelings. So just using part of our awareness just to acknowledge this is hard right now. You know, we are in a conflict situation. This hurts, it's difficult. So in other words, we're with compassion, we're with the suffering, we're with the pain of the fact that we are in conflict with our partner. And we also, we have a little space. So we aren't fused with it. We've got a little space to say, okay, a little awareness here. And that gives us more freedom, more room 
to perhaps choose what to do next instead of just reacting. So that's really key. And that's, and that's why there's so much work on mindfulness. This is the gift that mindfulness gives us is that little bit of space around what we're feeling so that we can choose what to do next. And then we can remember um, our humanity of this. First of all, you can remember the humanity of your partner. Your partner's hurting as well. I'm hurting, my partner's hurting. Um, this is normal. This happens to couples. Actually, this is part of most relationships. There's nothing, nothing wrong or, you know, um, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say nothing wrong because obviously there can be unhealthy relationship interactions, but there's nothing wrong with me for feeling, you know, the fact that I'm having a conflict or that, um, you know, it's nothing, it's not abnormal. This mm -hmm. is part of being a human being. People have conflicts. And so when you do that, the reason it's so important is because oftentimes we kind of feel like it's just me or we feel shame or we kind of feel like, you know, no one else, my partner, no one else can understand what I'm going through. When you humanize it, then, then somehow you don't feel so alone, which is really key. And then you bring in the kindness, right? And so I would actually recommend you start with kindness for yourself before you move to kindness to your partner. Because what happens if you go straight trying to be kind to your partner and maybe understanding them and you ignore yourself, those unmet needs inside of yourself are just like waiting to explode. Right? They, they need to be tended to in some ways first. Put your own oxygen mask on before helping someone else, right? Mm -hmm. So going to yourself and maybe, you know, just internally, you don't have to say anything about it. You can maybe just say to yourself something like, you know, oh gosh, Kristen, this is so hard. I'm so sorry. I'm here for you. You know, I'll help you. I'm here. You know, what can I do? How can I help? I understand. Um, you know, you're, you're a good person. Whatever you need to hear. If you need words of affirmation, if you need motivation, you know, might be like, okay, you're strong. You can stand up to this. You, you know, your, mm. your needs are important too. Whatever it is you need to hear in that moment, you can actually say that to yourself. I also recommend physical touch. Mm hmm. Because again, evolutionarily, physical touch is we're, we evolved to, to experience touch as a signal of care. So, you know, maybe just fold your arms, but not like out of a, pla a place of anger, but just like kind of holding yourself, folding your arms, mm. right? So your partner doesn't even need to know you're doing it. And then when you give yourself compassion for the pain of the conflict, then I would start to maybe open it up and, and talk to your partner and also have compassion for them and the pain that they're going through. Uh, but remembering that your needs count too, and knowing that ultimately you're responsible for your own happiness and well-being, and not to put it all on your partner. Mm hmm. You're speaking to the to the anxiously attached here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. So in the meeting your own needs, telling yourself what you need to hear, I'm really trying to distill it down to. Yeah, what do you actually say? Yes, is it what you hope to hear from? somebody else? <laughs> oh, so this is actually a good question because honesty is what we also need to hear. So it's not just like what you want to hear because what you want to hear is, oh, there's no problem. It was fine that you like, I don't know, showed up for half an hour late to the, to your dinner and didn't call. This may be what you want to hear, but is that the truth? No, it's not the truth right. because actually maybe that's why your partner's so mad at you, right? So you need honesty, but we need to hear the, this honest feedback in a constructive manner. What would help us most in the moment? First of all, remembering that our worth is unconditional. It's not contingent on what we do even, but we want to be healthy and happy. So how can we be healthy and happy in, 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 and also including in our relationship? So we need honest, constructive feedback like, yeah, actually, I could see how maybe my partner would be upset because I was half an hour late. Well, you know, people make mistakes. You know, I was busy, but maybe an apology would be really warranted here. Mm. And, you know, and, and, and also, what could I do next time that maybe would help me, you know, try to not be late for by half an hour? Maybe I can set a timer on my phone. In other words, kind of very concrete things of what would, what would help the most. Remembering that lying to yourself, although it may feel good, is not actually helpful. So it's not what do I want to hear, what do I need to hear? It's going to be most most healthy and lead to well-being. Important point because we can fool Absolutely. ourselves. The, yeah, you know, right. the brain is tricky. <laughs> well, and it almost sounds like you're differentiating between what we need and what we want as like true compassion versus the pity piece. I almost hear 
the self-pity of if we're wrapped up in, oh, um, I need to hear that I'm perfect and that they're the yeah. one that's wrong and all of those kinds of things. Yeah, that's not actually helpful. Right. Compassion is concerned with the alleviation of suffering. And when you lie to yourself, or let's say you, you do wallow in self-pity, which you know, it's, you don't have to beat yourself up for it, but it actually exacerbates her suffering. It doesn't alleviate it. Right. So what's gonna really help? That's, that's our ultimate goal with compassion, is we wanna be well, we wanna be feel safe, we wanna feel peaceful, we wanna feel happy. Does this tie at all into um, your idea of fierce compassion? How does fierce compassion come into the, and how does it differentiate from self-compassion? Can you say a little bit about that? Yes, okay, so lately, my latest book actually, before the burnout book, was on a fierce self-compassion. You might say um, it's not really different as much as there are two main ways self-compassion can be expressed. It has a tender, accepting form, and it has a fierce, action-oriented form. Mm. So to alleviate our suffering, sometimes what we need is acceptance. And this is primarily acceptance of ourselves unconditionally, right? And also acceptance of our emotions and the fact that we can't totally control things. You know, that, that is reality. We, we are not in total control. We can't control our emotions that arise. We can't even control all our thoughts. So the ability to accept um, ourselves and our present moment experience as is, leads to the reduction of suffering. And this is where the kind of more tender feelings of like unconditional love and acceptance come in. And so although we do need to accept ourselves unconditionally, we don't want to accept all our behaviors unconditionally or all the situations <laughs> we're in unconditionally okay. because that wouldn't be helping, right? So if I make a mistake, yeah, it doesn't mean that I am a mistake. I can love myself unconditionally even though I've made a mistake. But it wouldn't be loving or helpful to say, oh, therefore that mistake doesn't matter. We also want to do something to alleviate our suffering, which means, and this is more aimed, it's not like totally black and white, but it's aimed more at behaviors and situations that are unhealthy. Carl Rogers said, the curious paradox is the more I accept myself, the more I can change. Mm. So once we know that we are unconditionally worthy, flaws and all, mistakes and all, then that actually gives us the stable emotional foundation from which to try to make changes in our behaviors. You know, as best we can, we will never be perfect. We will always make mistakes. There's always room for growth. You know, after 30 years of practicing, there's still a lot of room for growth. <laughs> That's just the way life is. But the fear of self-compassion is about, again, motivating change in our behaviors, but also situations. So for instance, and this is really important in romantic relationships, we, we can't give ourselves away to other people. And so drawing boundaries, saying no, learning when to say, I would love to help you, but I can't, or, you know, my needs are important too. That's a huge part of self-compassion. Right. Sometimes we give ourselves away because we want other people to like us. We don't draw boundaries because maybe my partner won't like it if I say no. Or this also can apply to work colleagues or anyone or even family members. They won't like me if I say no, so I'm going to say yes. So when we have the unconditional self-acceptance of tender self-compassion, this actually frees us to say no and to draw boundaries when we need to for our well well-being. It also allows us to meet our needs. It gives us permission to realize that, you know what? My needs count too. <laughs> Even though people may tell me that I'm only valuable because I'm the ultimate loving wife or mother who's always self-sacrificing, mm. society will tell you that because, I hate to say it, but the patriarchy really wants women to be meeting the needs of everyone else except herself. <laughs> so self-compassion says, well, yeah, of course my children's needs are important. My, the, my partner's needs are important. But my needs are also important. So again, how, how, how can I balance all of them? How can I you know, spend time meeting my own needs as well as those of others? It's like, it's a balanced situation. It's interesting and I talk about gender a little bit because not biological sex differences, but gender role socialization socializes men and women differently. So men, I mean, this is really such a, so harmful to, to people raised as boys and men. They aren't allowed to be tender. If they're like soft or like accepting or, you know, like sensitive, they get bullied, they get called names. And so a lot of mm -hmm. boys are just shut that down, which means they're shutting down this incredibly powerful source of coping and resilience, emotional intelligence really, because they're socialized out of it. They are allowed to be fierce, to be action oriented, to do, to, you know, achieve things, to say no. And so in some ways the, the fierceness helps them. They're, they're certainly 
taught, at least traditionally, that they're entitled to meet their needs, but they aren't, they aren't allowed to be sensitive or tender, which is just a tragedy. And so people socialized as girls, you know, they're actually told to be meet people, other people's needs, but not their own. So tenderness is really valued primarily for others. And then um, saying no, rocking the boat, speaking up, you know, so we don't like women who are too ambitious or maybe too mouthy or too loud. So it's, it's perhaps not as extreme as this gender socialization for boys, but it, but it's still there and it definitely also harms um, girls and women as well. And this is a beautiful thing about self-compassion and it comes to, again down to authenticity. Everyone has both a fierce and tender side. It's kind of like yin and yang. These are universal human energies. And when we start to care a little bit less about what society says about us, and we start to really say, okay, what's true for me, then every individual can express these energies in their own unique way that works for them. Right. So using these practices to find, I don't want to say the gap, but to find the balance. Because based on our socialization, we probably have an imbalance somewhere in there whether it's on the tender caring side or whether it's on the action oriented, you know, stand up and take care of myself side. And so fierce compassion and self-compassion work together to create that balance. Yeah, absolutely. I like to call it caring force. If you take the two together, it's like, so we can, we, we can claim our power, but it's a caring power. So we, we might get angry, but we're not angry at people, which causes harm. Mm -hmm. We're angry at situations, which cause harm. You know, in other words, is this helping or harming me or others? Mm -hmm. Really very simple. What do I need that's helpful to me or others? Oh, so simple, but not easy. There's times it can get into conflict. So I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that this is easy. It gets really messy in real life, you know, yeah. compassionate mess. <laughs> Sometimes we need to stand up for ourselves more. Maybe sometimes we need to be a little more quiet. It just depends on the situation. You know, sometimes we need to go left. Sometimes we need to go right. And here's the thing, only you really know. Um, but if you're honest with yourself and you really care about yourself and you really want the best for yourself, then, you know, really that's the most important. And then you'll figure it out eventually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it takes a while, but you know, or not, but at least during, at least in the process of trying to figure it out, your heart's open and you're in a state of loving, connected presence. And the fierce version of loving, connected presence is brave, empowered clarity. Ooh. Kindness allows us to be brave, feeling connected like we aren't alone, helps us feel empowered. And the mindfulness gives us clarity. Ooh, okay. So, and, and both are really essential. Can you say that one more time? So I'm sure I got yes. it. <laughs> so tender self-compassion is a loving, connected presence. And fierce self-compassion is brave, empowered clarity, which just kind of gives you a little sense of how it feels in your body even. Uh, even if, I, as I say that, I sit up straighter. Yeah. You roll your shoulders back. And so these, these are slightly different energies that we embody. Both are important and both need to be in balance as much as possible anyway. And so brave, empowered clarity relates to the three pieces of self-compassion. Yes, kindness, common humanity, and mindfulness. So you're having a conflict with your partner, for instance. Mm -hmm. So we want both loving, connected presence with your partner, but also sometimes we need brave, empowered clarity, not to be a doormat, not to just cave in. But again, sometimes when that brave and empowered clarity starts becoming aggressive or not thinking of your partner, then you've gone too far over the other side. So it's always, it's always a balance, an act of balancing and rebalancing. It's a, it's a process. It's not an end state. Right. So what would you say to, not, not necessarily just women, but what would you say to people who struggle with you know, we've talked about some, some misconceptions and the struggle with um, self-compassion. What would you say to someone who is struggling with fierce self-compassion, with fierce compassion, that side of it? A lot of people struggle, but I think especially people raised in more traditional gender roles, they struggle because people don't like us as much when we're fierce. Mm. I'm sorry, I think of like Kamala Harris. Oh, she's so ambitious. Well, you know, people don't like her because she's fierce. It's yeah. a it's a real thing in the world. Every single person needs to find their own way through with that. To what extent can you handle people maybe not liking you as much as you would want them to? But really, this is why we need both because 
when we have tender self-compassion, which, which we really know in our bones that our worth is unconditional. It just, it just comes from being a human being. Mm. We don't have to earn the right to be worthy. We don't have to like go to graduate school to be worthy of compassion. It's our birthright as a human being. All human beings are intrinsically valuable. And when you know that through tender self-compassion, then that gives you a lot of safety and security to care a little bit less about what people think of you. You know, obviously you don't want to get like fired from your job or lose all your friends. You want, you want to take this <laughs> into account, but you know, maybe be a little, a little more willing to risk saying no. And you know, I would, I would love to help you, but no, I'm sorry. I just, you know, I, I have to do this for myself or I don't have time or it's not right. good for me. Um, and hopefully, the people who really love you and really care about you would want you to stand up for yourself and care for yourself. Mm -hmm. It makes so much intuitive sense. It like yes. feels as you talk about it, and I'm sure as the listeners are listening to this, there is like you can feel that this is meaningful, that we have these capabilities within us. Um, and you can also imagine it being so messy and, and complicated and human and there's so much here. Yeah. Well, I will say one thing, though, is it's easier than it sounds because most of us have actually learned these skills, not only of uh, tenderness, but also protection with other people. So mm. with our kids, you know, most of us, not everyone, but most of us, you know, we, we love our children unconditionally, even when they make mistakes. And we also know how to encourage them, how to motivate them. You know, we, we know how to balance unconditional acceptance with wanting them to achieve their best and helping them. We know how to be a good supportive friend to people. Like if your friend came to you and said, oh, at work, they're just, they're asking me to work 30, you know, you you'd probably say, hey, no, you need to stand up for yourself. Mm. You know, or someone was picking on your friend or picking on your child or our pets. It's funny. Mm -hmm. Often we, we develop these skills most strongly with our pets because our pets are so uncomfortable complicated. You know, we're there for our pets. We protect our pets. We take care of our pets. Um, you know, again, not, not everyone, but most people have developed these skills fairly powerfully with others. And so we have the template. It's not like we have to reinvent the wheel. We have that wheel. It's in our wheelhouse, so right. to speak. <laughs> First thing we need to do is to give ourselves permission to be this way with ourselves. And a lot of that is getting over these myths about it's going to make me lazy or selfish or self-indulgent, which it won't. Mm -hmm. And then it's about remembering. You know, so any way you could remember doing that. And that's why, again, joining a community or reading books or doing a daily practice, listening to something guided, putting sticky notes on your computer monitor, if that's what it takes, you know, some way to try to remind ourselves of this truth. It, it, as you say, most people, when they think about it, it does make intuitive sense. Just like it wouldn't make sense to anyone probably to motivate a friend or a child the way we, we try to motivate or relate to ourselves. We know how, how unhelpful that would be. Mm-hmm. And yet we do it with ourselves. Oh, another really easy way to, to do it is just ask yourself, what would I say to a good friend who's in the exact same position I'm in? And then more often than not, we, we kind of know what we might say, what would be helpful and what wouldn't be helpful. Yeah, that is, <laughs> that's such a helpful way to frame it, that we already have these tools. We already have yes. the map, the template. It's, it's about learning how to reapply that template to our relationship with ourself. And if you can get your partner mm. on board, you can't, you can't shove it down anyone's throat. But if you can, it really helps. Right, I believe that. Because, you know, they're the person you're with, you know, the most in many, many ways. And if they can help remind you, self-compassion. And also a little bit of relief to your partner. Oh, great. I don't have to be the sole source of your compassion. Yes, you right. can kind of support yourself and be compassionate yourself. Wonderful. You know, then maybe I can focus on my own needs sometimes. Mm, it's a win-win. <laughs> so it's a win-win, yeah. In the work that you do, the research that you've done, what is one thing you wish everybody knew? I think the thing I wish everyone knew is that it's like right here in your back pocket. It's so, it's right here in our own awareness and mm. our own heart. It doesn't take money. It doesn't take time, really. I mean, in the moment, at any moment, just shift from being absorbed by what's happening and judging what's happening or judging ourselves to opening our heart to how are we, you know, can we relate to what's happening with warmth, 
with space, with a feeling of connectedness to the larger whole. And it's like we've got a superpower in our back pocket. We don't even know it's there. So if people knew that, I think things would be a little easier. <laughs> that's, that's a wonderful way to wrap this up. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to chat with all of us today. Where can people find you? Ah, well, first of all, it's been an absolute pleasure. You're a wonderful interviewer. Oh, thanks. Um, and people can find me at uh, selfcompassion.org. Just Google self-compassion and you'll find me. Again, you can take the self-compassion test if you want to test your level of self-compassion. I've got a lot of free um, practices and downloads. And if you think this may be something for you, you can also join our community for very low monthly fee. We have scholarships. Mm. Um, and the nice thing about that is we have mentors who can actually help you and guide you along the way in your practice. I'll link all of that in the description and in the show notes. And um, we're going to head over to the Patreon extended episode, the extended version now, where Dr. Neff is going to take us through a self-compassion practice together. So I'm excited for that. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed the episode. Before you go, I just want to say a quick thank you to everybody for the reception that this podcast has gotten so far, especially those of you who are rating and reviewing the show, who are following on Instagram and leaving comments or in the Patreon community commenting on the episodes. It's been such a long time coming to actually get this out to all of you and seeing the reception has just been such a wild experience already. So I just wanted to say thank you. Another thank you to Nancy for partnering with us on this video. Remember, you can use the code Elena J to get 25% off your order at checkout. And I would personally recommend checking out the Beginner Bliss Bundle if you're curious about exploring some different sensations. I hope that you're having a good day wherever you are and I'll talk to you in the next one. Bye. Thanks for listening. You can also access all of our extended cut episodes with bonus content from every single guest over on Patreon at patreon.com slash Elena Joy. That's patreon.com slash A-L-A-Y-N-A Joy. And be sure to follow us on Instagram at sleepingaroundpod for updates, teasers, episode discussions, and more. This episode was produced by Elena Joy and Danae Fender and edited by Lucian Brinkley. See you next time back here on the couch.